frente uh, da, da, da empresa. Aqui é, um, é o esquema que, que, que apresento. No booking, atualmente, sou o número 1. Um, uh, das 52 falhas, uh, das 63 falhas, 52 já são válidas e já foram corrigidas. Uh, o Agora, por exemplo, ao terceiro lugar, faz parte do grupo do booking. Mas uh, isto é um convite também privado que tive. Uh, embora seja privado, o booking já, uh, já comunicou à comunicação social que uh, existe um programa onde as pessoas podem uh, enviar vulnerabilidades uh, desta plataforma e inclui todo o seu domínio e todo o seu, o seu grupo de empresas. Nas falhas mais comuns, uh, em relação à Cobalt, uh, isto estou a falar mais ou menos de 250 reportes. Isto foi apresentado na B-Sites, uh, no qual eu, quem não me conhece, uh, fico ao convite para, para, para participar em este ano, que é um, um evento muito interessante aqui em Lisboa. Uh, a, que mais, a vulnerabilidade que eu mais achei interessante e que me deu mais dinheiro foi o Reflected File Download. Uh, é uma vulnerabilidade que já existe desde 2014, uh, descoberta por Ora Natif e apresentada na Black Hat de 2014. Uh, e, e poucas pessoas conhecem. O que é que eu fiz? Eu agarrei uma vulnerabilidade que falava-se pouquíssimo e tentei dizer um volteu um pouco mais. E comecei a ver que, ok, estamos num mundo agora que tudo funciona com APIs, Reflected File Download não é muito virada para. Uh, não é um problema da APIs, mas é um problema de JSON Files. Pode, pode trazer grandes problemas de segurança, dependendo sempre de, de, do impacto, como é óbvio, do cenário. Mas foi a vulnerabilidade que eu mais encontrei uh, na Cobalt. Uh, a seguir o típico cross-site scripting, uh, é normal encontrar. E o cross-site request forger também uh, foi dos mais, mais comuns. Uh, na Cobalt, o reflect que falo no uh, foi... Uh, sem sombra de dúvida, uh, uma das coisas que, além de eu ter encontrado diversas, ajudou-me muito, mas muito, a subir no ranking da Cobalt. Por isso também foi uma questão de sorte, porque pouca gente sabia do conhecimento desta vulnerabilidade. Eu apenas... Uh, houve, houve um próprio uh, hora na que descobriu esta falha, disse mesmo, ok, eu descobri esta falha, mas tu desenvolveste-a e tornaste-a acessível para outras pessoas. Eu escrevi um white paper sobre isto, podem pesquisar na net, não é, não é difícil, aparece logo no Google, mas é uma vulnerabilidade que quem, quem gosta de descobrir coisas novas é bastante interessante uh, terem essa oportunidade de, de, de partir algum tempo de ler. É que no ano, completamente diferente, cross site script, logo, estamos a falar de stored, reflected, vlog, o que for, uh, descobri imensos. Uh, Posso dizer mesmo que o Booking tinha imensas falhas para o site scripting. Uh, já não tem tantas, graças a Deus. Ainda bem para mim, porque eu descobri a maior parte delas e já foi pago. Uh, mas uh, foi das, das, de, dos programas que estavam mais vulneráveis a este tipo de situações e principalmente a Store. Eu conseguia uh, fazer pedidos uh, a, um, a um proprietário e roubar a sessão do proprietário e tinha acesso caso do senhor, e mudava e alterava as tarifas, uh, conseguia mesmo uh, o admin máximo do booking, uh, os moradores que mudaram as casas, os alojamentos e etc, e podia apagar alojamentos e fazer o que eu quisesse. Uh, isto num ambiente controlado que eles prepararam para, para os antes uh, poderem experimentar. Uh, Cross-site set, cross request for junta foi muito comum, uh, wide door, muito comum, principalmente agora nas, nas APIs, uh, e começam a aparecer uh, as partes de injection, uh, principalmente a CSV injection, uh, template injection como o Angular uh, e outras, outras, outros frameworks que permitem fazer este tipo de, de, de ataques. Uma coisa eu, nestes 500, 500 vulnerabilidades que eu encontrei, bastante comum é que cross-site scripting já. já já tem imenso tempo e é tão conhecido na área de segurança que continua a ser um dos maiores problemas, tal como o próximo site do Best Forge. Uh, uma das, das, das situações que tenho deparado é que, uh, para quem quer começar, eu não sei se aqui alguém já experimentou um programa de bug bounty, uh, é interessante começar com parte das APIs, porque são pouquíssimo testadas. Uh, desde, uh, 
Inclusive a Cycle Injection nas APIs, é possível. Uh, podemos aceder uh, popular. Vou falar sobre a parte. Eu tenho o LPS. Este LPS. Você nem morreu. O programa da executiva do Departamento de Defesa norte-americano que decidiu criar um programa de balde e pagar a quem encontrasse vulnerabilidades no Pentágono. Quem é que não quer? Isto é um sonho para qualquer bug bounty ou researcher ou script kid e hacker ou que queiram chamar. E então deu um mês, na Hacker One, em que podiam testar um grande número de sites pertencentes ao Departamento de Defesa. Foi uma iniciativa bastante interessante, teve um feedback fantástico. Eles tinham pagamentos entre 100 uh, da mais, uh, para vulnerabilidades mais baixas e 15 mil para as mais graves. Uh, nas primeiras 6 horas tiveram imensos reportes, inundaram os moderadores do, do, do Hacker One com, com vulnerabilidades no Pentágono. Uh, Tiveram um grande número de participantes, é óbvio, quem é que não queria participar nisso? Uh, para cada research, uma mínima de 100 km a proteger sites uh, pertencentes ao, ao Pentágono, é sem dúvida uma que uh, receber, disseram, não, não, isto não é um tipo, isto não é um RC, vocês não conseguem fazer nada com isto. Uh, e pediram mais dados. Uh, e então ele mostrou mesmo os dados do servidor uh, e conseguiu mesmo root, o acesso máximo ao servidor de alojamento uh, do Pentágono e disse, ok, o livro está aqui. Uh, querem mais? E eles, ok, tens razão, ficam parados por aqui, <risos> vamos ter mais problemas e então uh, acho que ficou provado. E acontece muito isto, uh, por vezes, se um researcher ou um hunter não uh, comprovar algumas das situações ou for mal explicado a vulnerabilidade, poderá ter de surgir algo mais alguma comunicação a esta e por isso é importante uh, sempre dar o máximo de informação uh, não exagerar também ao ponto de comprometer dados e, e, e até transportar esses dados para fora, que é pior, uh, mas convém -se sempre haver uma boa comunicação e por isso a importância de programas como o Hacker One e Cobol para moderarem este tipo de, de, de situações. É um link muito política, atenção, uh, eu gostei muito foi da imagem, uh, porque após uh, a, a o, o programa que foi feito, o Act of Pentagon, uh, a direção de Trump decidiu que vai continuar uh, a manter o programa de Bug Bounty. Uh, eu achei o pormenor e até sublinhei porque baixa os valores uh, de custo e se mantém os sites mais seguros. Bom, é óbvio, claro. Uh, mas se ele aprova esta mensagem, quem, quem pode dizer o contrário do Sr. Trump, não é? Uh, a grande questão agora que eu coloco porque eu não tirei nenhuma conclusão com isto, porque provavelmente desse lado haverá pessoas mais competentes para decidir e até para dar uma luz mais importante sobre este tema, que é, será que Portugal poderia ter um programa de background? Será que nós tínhamos essa capacidade de responder, de criar, de moderar este tipo de situação? Eu creio as vantagens e desvantagens do meu ponto de vista. Uh, como vantagens, vou começar pelos pontos positivos, como é óbvio, uh, os sites governamentais seriam mais seguros, pronto, isso é óbvio. Uh, baixava o número de ataques de script que é isso. Basicamente, uh, eu não sei se vocês têm visto nas notícias alguns grupos uh, que gostam de meter na comunicação social e mandar uns sites abaixo, uh, porque carregaram um botão ou fizeram um ping e, e acharam que são os maiores hackers do mundo, ou em Portugal. Uh, ou então acharam que no passo de vida encontraram os e-mails e a comunicação social acha que aquilo é um leak de informação e os e-mails são públicos. Uh, pronto, esta situação muitas vezes ajuda uh, que baixem este tipo de ataques uh, de, 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 do script que diz. Depois, promove a, a segurança uh, em Portugal, como é óbvio. Se Portugal ou o governo português tiveram um programa de workbound, vai ser ouvido em todo o mundo. Epá, estes gajos são pioneiros ou quase pioneiros, uh, um país tão pequeno, mas está super avançado na tecnologia, importam-se e 
interessa-se bastante. No programa de Black Bounce, muitas vezes, atenção, atenção, nos programas de Black Bounce, sabemos quem é que está a é interessante. O custo e a manutenção de um programa como este. Eu sei que para o Hacker One é preciso pagar para ter moderadores. E então, pode-se optar por ter uma equipa interna, portuguesa, a gerir este programa. Ou seja, escolhia-se alguns researchers, uns antas, uns profissionais já existentes de segurança, ou um departamento já existente em Portugal, e podiam gerir e moderar todas as vulnerabilidades que seriam encontradas no, em sites governamentais portugueses. São teste, eles vão dados. Muitas vezes vão testar uh, sites governamentais. E então uh, será um pouco difícil, se não forem criados alguns filtros, que será difícil também uh, para distinguir o que é que é bom e o que é mau, quem é que está a testar e quem é que está realmente a fazer um ataque. Uh, este acho que é também um dos pontos que eu acho uma, uma grande desvantagem. Então eu pensei mais ou menos no se a lei o permitisse, claro. Uh, ter um simultâneo não falta isso, porque explícita teria de estar fora do, do, do scope. Uh, e acima de tudo, não divulgar a informação que encontrou para fora. É óbvio. Isto aqui, podemos estar a lidar com informação confidencial que nunca deve transparecer cá para fora. Uh, e é, é mais ou menos isto que eu tinha para, para vos explicar. Eu espero que tenham tido algumas luzes do que é o Bird Bounty. Um bocado também a diferença entre o pen testing e, e este tipo de, de programas de apreciação de bugs. Uh, e fica a questão: será que Portugal poderá ter um programa de bug bounty? Seu? Pronto, e é isto. Obrigado. Existe um... É assim, é difícil, uh, assim, uma palavra, uma, 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 uma resposta rápida, porque é preciso muita dedicação, tempo. Uh, eu não tinha muito, eu fazia isto como hobby, mas eu já era um profissional na área, já tinha mais ou menos umas luzes da coisa. Uh, e, mas há vários guias, por exemplo, ver uh, relatórios já públicos do Hacker One, que são permitidos, uh, e dá para ver já, ter uma ideia daquilo que já foi uh, feito, que foi pago, os valores de determinadas vulnerabilidades uh, e, e é um livro muito bom uh, que é um, acho que até online custa 9,99 do The Hours uh, que, que é tipo uma compilação de todas os, os, os vulnerabilidades que foram reportadas para o público e, e ele faz sempre uma explicação, uma introdução de cada tipo de vulnerabilidade e eu recomendo essa leitura porque uh, é o autor é perigoso e podemos fazer um pedido de mediação para depois a empresa falar, o Hacker One falar com a empresa e acelerar esse processo. Se me tiver a falar de uma empresa pública, não, eu não o faço. Uh, eles podem comprometer. Uh, eles demoraram dois anos e meio. É assim, isto não cabe na cabeça de qualquer empresa para tentar resolver esta situação. Sim, são dois anos e meio. E por isso a política, muitas vezes, do Google, dos 90 dias, eu acho que é uma boa política. Mas, na maior parte das empresas que eu não, 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 não resulta. Não resulta. E muitas vezes não funciona só com ética. Infelizmente é assim. Eu espero que tenha respondido à sua questão. Sim. Que para 
mentalidade vai mudando um bocado no nosso país, principalmente com a ajuda de vários eventos, tal como este, que me uh, para as pessoas uh, perceberem um bocado que, que isto é uma área que tem que crescer. Somos um país pequeno, mas temos muito talento, muito talento. Vocês não fazem a mínima ideia da quantidade de researchers que há uh, em Portugal e a trabalhar lá fora, uh, e que são respeitados por, por, por grandes empresas. Isso é importante. Também estamos a representar o nosso país, não é? Isso, uh, e já que Fica o convite com o CTF, se costumas, a ver sites que costumam fazer um CTF. Sim, sim. Pronto, fica o convite. É quando o mercado está a
30, sim. Uh, quando, faltar, quando passarem 20 minutos, okay. faltam 5 minutos, depois dá tempo para as perguntas. Uhum, uhum. Uh, portanto, são 5 minutos para as perguntas. Eu consigo passar a... rápido os slides. Eu sei, eu já as, as questões é que são sempre mais... Eu já vi a apresentação. Hum. Esta tem no, na confraria. Esta tipo é mais... Eu tenho muito mais slides do que essa. Tem, tem. Fica mais escuro, não? Ok. É preto e branco, sim. Boa tarde. Boa tarde aos nossos que vieram na sessão. Esta apresentação é do Luís Gomes. Chama-se Lucky Me. Confesso que já vi parte desta apresentação, mas também até que já foi alterado. E confesso que foi das apresentações mais interessantes que eu vi nos últimos anos. É mais um representante da APDC. Uh, tem experiência de cerca de 8 ou 9 anos na área de segurança informática, tanto no público como no privado, em Portugal, no estrangeiro. Uh, e vamos mostrar aqui uma auditoria de segurança em um método de black box, uh, um sistema de. Lutaria. Uh, yeah. Ora bem. Conseguem-me ouvir, não? Conseguem-me ouvir, não? Tá. Yeah. Então, uh, antes de mais, isto é uma. Como já foi dito, é uma apresentação sobre um dispositivo que existe em produção em alguns países. Uh, existe em Portugal, neste momento no, já tem as mitigações implementadas, mas existe também em, em pelo menos mais quatro países da comunidade europeia e é utilizado para gerar uh, números de lotaria que podem ascender entre o mínimo é um milhão de euros, o máximo pode ir até, que eu tenha conhecimento, 10 milhões. Uh, portanto, a nível de, de ser um alvo para potenciais atacantes é extremamente atrativo. A história é mais ou menos este slide, uh, no, a versão filme, mas na vida real, porque o objetivo era uh, de uma forma completamente black box, ou seja, sem ter nenhum conhecimento prévio do, do alvo, conseguir entrar e sair com o dinheiro. Portanto, ter ainda a, a, a capacidade de gastar o dinheiro após o ataque. Isto é um, é um pouco sobre mim, portanto, existe a minha experiência profissional, uh, passa por maior parte das, das empresas que estão a ver ali, sendo que a maior parte dela foi na CIB. Uh, e o restante foi ao longo dos últimos anos. Se quiserem, depois podem adicionar algumas das redes sociais. Uh, esta é a empresa que represento neste momento. Um, e não foi neste contexto de, desta empresa, mas ainda fazemos este tipo de auditorias para, para vários tipos de clientes. Um, aqui vamos falar, aqui mais uma vez é só reiterar o assunto que já está a ser falado, que é ganhar a lotaria e sair de lá com o dinheiro. Aqui estamos a falar um pouco do potencial uh, europeu a nível da, da lotaria. Portanto, estes são os resultados de algumas das lotarias e dos lucros que as empresas que geram uh, o seu negócio através deste tipo de, de mercado. E no caso da, da Camelot, que é a detentora do mercado no, na UK, há de ser 5.5 bilhões. Uh, neste é da, da Holanda. Reparem que são os países onde existe o dispositivo que eu, que eu vou testar. Uh, e neste tipo de lucros, uma parte interessante é que nunca é considerada a segurança como o um fator primordial. É sempre ou entra no fim ou entra após existir algum tipo de problema uh, a nível da segurança, claro. Se já aconteceu, provavelmente. Uh, neste momento nós vamos ver a auditoria ser feita do princípio ao fim, mas isto é alguns ataques que já foram feitos uh, a lutarias no mundo todo. Uh, alguns já, já tiveram alguns lucros avultados, outros provavelmente é difícil, porque é, uma, é, uma, é um negócio que já é muito antigo. É difícil neste momento ter uma previsão do que é que já foi feito a nível de ataques, mas uh, a Camelot estima que exista um risco de negócio próximo dos 30% do valor anual, o que é bastante, visto que é 5.5 bilhões um, o valor total que eles, que eles conseguem gerar anualmente. Uh, o alvo já foi falado. Eu não, não estou autorizado a mostrar o dispositivo, mas ao longo do. Mas vamos ver ecrãs e ao longo do, da apresentação vão conseguir identificar uh, fatores únicos que vão perceber qual é que é o dispositivo. <risos> Exato. As únicas um, informações que eu tinha é que este dispositivo que eu ia testar 
tinha um prémio na ordem de um milhão de euros e que existia num local público com acesso uh, à extração do sorteio. Ou seja, aquele dispositivo estava exatamente numa sala igual a esta, uh, alguns por baixo desta mesa, ou talvez ali, ligado por cabo de rede, e que eu podia ter acesso àquela sala pelo menos duas vezes por semana, que era quando existiam os sorteios. Uh, exato, isto era o prize money. O local era, era muito parecido com este, sendo que este é onde existe a extração do lutarino atualmente. Um, o meu primeiro problema aqui seria qual é que era a forma que eu conseguia ter acesso à rede. Portanto, eu aqui ainda não tinha minimamente a noção de como é que era sequer o dispositivo fisicamente. Não sabia se era um, se era um computador, se era um device pequenino, se era, não tinha qualquer tipo de informação. Uh, portanto, só tinha duas formas de imaginar uma comunicação saudável entre o dispositivo e a representação uh, no, no ecrã principal do número premiado e só podia, só podia ter acesso de, através do cabo de rede ou através do Wi-Fi. Uh, neste caso, até foi uh, através do cabo de rede, mas uh, podia ter sido por, cabo, por, cabo de, podia ter sido por Wi-Fi porque também tinha redes abertas naquele mesmo sítio. Um, os meus primeiros objetivos durante o reconhecimento seria identificar a rede, Uh, mapear a superfície de ataque, ou seja, perceber o, em que, de que tipo de forma é que eu poderia uh, quebrar a segurança do dispositivo e uh, verificar se existia mais do que uma forma de quebrar a segurança do dispositivo, porque eu, à partida, como não sabia nem sequer o sistema operativo, tinha, tinha que preparar para qualquer tipo de cenário. Uh, este foi o meu primeiro scan. Quando liguei o cabo de rede, fiz um scan à rede toda, todos os dispositivos estavam dentro da rede. O meu primeiro scan, as partes mais interessantes que eu consegui perceber foi que existiam portas altas que o Nmap, que neste caso era a ferramenta que eu estava a utilizar, não conseguia perceber o que é que era, mas estavam filtered, mas as, as portas abertas, que no caso a 55.801, corria algum tipo de serviço eh, em, com SSL, mas eu não sabia que tipo de serviço é que era. Até, neste momento não sabia. Mais tarde vamos ter conhecimento do que é que se passava lá. Estas portas altas eram as únicas portas que eu conseguia ver, tanto algum tipo, para as únicas que estavam abertas, uh, que me interessava, porque as outras eram portas standard do sistema operativo Windows. Uh, mas uma coisa que eu tirei logo foi a informação do certificado, que estava aqui, e mais à frente vamos perceber porque é que era útil, porque na fase de reconhecimento é muito importante, até os pequenos detalhes, que para, podem parecer ridículos, guardar todo o tipo de informação que fosse possível. Uh, para alguém que perceba de encriptação. Também, se calhar, esta parte de ter o SSL V2 suporte não era muito inteligente. Mas uh, esta foi a minha, o meu primeiro passo inicial depois de estar dentro da rede. Corri, obviamente, o NES, porque era importante, porque acho que é, gostava de ter um pouco mais de informação sobre o alvo. No entanto, uh, eu costumo dizer que depois daqui já não há nada para fazer. Porque hoje em dia, a maior parte de, de, das auditorias que nós conhecemos são baseadas em dois tipos, de, ou três tipos de de ferramentas e é isso que entregam aos clientes, sendo que é deixado de parte o fator primordial que é a capacidade de analisar uma, uma vulnerabilidade do lado de um atacante uh, que tem todo o tempo do mundo para atacar a vossa estrutura e que ele não se vai limitar a duas ferramentas de certeza absoluta, porque ele não, ele não tem tempo, ou seja, não, não tem um budget orçamentado de 5 dias para fazer, para fazer um assessment, é, é basicamente até conseguir quebrar a segurança. Uma das coisas que eu reparei neste momento foi que o RDP estava exposto e este era a, a, o meu resultado da fase inicial. Ou seja, eu sabia qual é que era o dispositivo. A primeira coisa que eu pensei foi qual é que será a parte mais fácil e isto sou eu a tentar transportar-vos para a minha mentalidade naquele momento. Qual é que eram um, as minhas opções para poder ter acesso ao dispositivo? Ou roubava fisicamente, o que ia contra uma das regras principais que eu tinha no início do assessment, que era entrar e sair, primeiro sem ser detectado, segundo, um, sem que ninguém percebesse que existia algum tipo de usurpação no, no sorteio. Depois, podia tentar sinifar as ligações com o Man in the Middle e ver se conseguia uh, alterar um, pac um pacote a meio do caminho e, e mudar o número da lotaria, por exemplo, que era representado no ecrã. Mais tarde foi-me dito que era possível ganhar a lotaria sem, na verdade, fazer uma... Uma, um bridge total do sistema, porque como era um ato público, bastava que tivesse representado no ecrã o número que eu queria para, ser, para me ser dado o prémio. Portanto, existem, existiam naquela altura mais uma informação útil que depois era, era importante. Um, podia também tentar quebrar a encriptação, visto que, como nós sabíamos, tinham aquelas portas altas em SSL que eu ainda não sabia o que é que estava a correr, o RDP estava exposto e eu percebi imediatamente, porque uma coisa era certa, se o dispositivo estava ali e aquilo era uma solução vendida com, como se chama dizer, chave na mão, ou seja, 
basicamente desde o software de, que gera o número até ao dispositivo, era tudo entregue ao cliente, o cliente não tinha, uh, sem ser a documentação, não tinha um, nenhum outro tipo de desenvolvimento dentro do, do dispositivo, aquilo era para fazer suporte ou assistência remota ao dispositivo caso houvesse problemas. Certamente, primeiro, este é o ecrã que eu vejo quando ligo ao, à porta da RDP. Reparem, além, estava novamente em francês, o que era consistente com aquilo que eu tinha visto anteriormente a nível do scan das portas. Uh, a primeira coisa que eu pensei foi, se eu vou tentar fazer aqui um, um ataque de força bruta, era, uma, ter uma ferramenta que me permitisse fazer os ataques de força bruta, neste caso dei dois exemplos, e a outra era uma word list francesa. Uh, porque fazia sentido, visto que o sistema operativo e tudo o resto estava em francês, a partir da sua cliente, não fiz, o cliente tivesse feito uma customização do, do device, tinha pelo menos tido o cuidado de, primeiro, tirar o administrador e, segundo, de verificar se, se existe a possibilidade ou não de fazer ataques de força bruta bem sucedidos, com ferramentas de lockout e etc. Um, o curioso neste, neste fator é, a primeira coisa que vocês pensam quando funcionam a nível de um RDP é a password foi de certeza pensada. E foi. Neste caso foi pensada. Como é que foi pensada? Alguém pensou que quando criou... Isto é um exemplo, porque eu não consigo pôr o ecrã específico que aparece, mas alguém deve lhe ter aparecido um ecrã e dizer tenha certeza que quero o administrador sem password. E o que é que ele fez? Sim, senhora, eu quero sem administrador. Portanto, ele tinha que ter a certeza que não queria uma palavra fácil. E foi, foi o que aconteceu. Uh, como é que isto aconteceu? Só para, terem um, para compreenderem como é, que, como é que eu cheguei a este exemplo, eu testei durante 45 minutos um ataque de força bruta. Ao fim de 45 minutos não tive sucesso. E então tentei testar três passwords manualmente. E numa das passwords, entre eu introduzir a primeira e a segunda password, eu apaguei a password e carreguei no Enter antes de carregar a password. E foi assim, e foi assim que eu entrei. Que era... Uh, foi... foi um bocado de hacking by mistake e o segundo, um epic fail da parte da pessoa que estava a fazer a segurança. Portanto, é importante uh, fazer um lockout do sistema operativo antes de estar em produção. Uh, este era o primeiro ecrã que eu via. Este era o meu primeiro ecrã. Eu não, não via o, a barra do Windows e etc. Ainda não sabia porquê, mas a, a primeira coisa que eu fiz foi carregar a, a Windows Key e o, e o E para ver, tentar ver o explorador. E esta era a minha primeira imagem. Aqui já estava, eu posso dizer que já tinha um bocadinho daquela semente do sucesso dentro de mim, porque eu a partir do momento em que tive... estava a correr como administrador, primeiro na máquina, que é espetacular. E depois porque já, já só me faltava perceber qual é que era a comunicação entre este endpoint está aqui e uh, o backend que gera o um número da lotaria. Essa era a parte que eu tinha ainda um bocado de receio, porque não sabia como é que era feita a comunicação, mas pelo menos já tinha acesso a isto. Uh, se eu soubesse nesta altura que bastava representar o um número no ecrã, provavelmente terminava aqui. Mas, uh, mas ainda não era agora. Então, o que é que acontecia? Exato. Foi este, esta era a minha, foi a cara que eu fiz. Quando, quando... Eu fui estudar o flow de comunicações. O flow de comunicações, uh, utilizei o Wireshark para tentar perceber o que é que acontecia à meio. Entretanto, depois também comecei a fazer Arc Poisoning para perceber se haviam mais dispositivos na rede a fazer o mesmo tipo de comunicação. E uh, era, era fácil de perceber que existiam dois. Um era o de produção, que era onde eu estava, e havia um teste. O nome era similar, imagine, era como se fosse dispositivo, um, uh, dispositivo de lotaria 1 e dispositivo de lotaria 2. E depois falavam sempre com o mesmo IP, que era, no caso, o back-end. E era sempre comunicações... Eu não conseguia perceber o que é que lá estava, porque estavam encriptados, mas era naquelas portas mais altas. Um, eu, eu até aqui ainda não, não fazia a mínima ideia de porque aquilo era um executável. Não era, um, não, posso dizer, não era uma ferramenta, era mesmo um executável. Portanto, eu não sabia de que forma é que o executável comunicava com, a, com o back-end. Então, o que é que eu podia fazer? Tinha que explorar o executável e perceber qual é que era a comunicação, de que forma é que ele efetuava a comunicação. Então, uh, fui fazer... Isto é, isto é o Wireshark atrás, eu tentar perceber as comunicações. Eu não vos mostro por causa de Job Security, of course, mas uh, aqui atrás eu abri um debugger para tentar perceber em que momento é que... em que a comunicação era iniciada com o backend e de que forma é que era feita. Uh, eu, quando fui ver as strings no, no, no executável, reparei que havia uma sequência interessante de de strings, que era uh, o server SSL estava ready e depois havia o server address e se vocês forem seguir ali por cima tinha ready, server address, porta, false, depois tinha um, um endereço e depois em baixo tinha uma string e depois dizia connection, etc, etc, etc. Eu quando vejo a string, a string era muito parecida com uma password, para vos ter uma certeza. E eu achei muito estranho tipo, ter uma string logo a seguir ó, à conexão da SSL, portanto falava em certificados, eu fiquei a pensar, será que é um... Aliás, foi esta, este, exatamente este, este quiz que eu fiz a mim mesmo. Era uma password do back-end, 
era a prova de que para o SSL, para, para o certificado de cliente que eles estavam a usar, ou era só uma string? Podia ser só uma string, ou alguma coisa que eles tivessem usado, talvez um, uma coisa de suporte. Curiosamente, e isto é um, este é o e-mail que eu enviei à empresa que produziu o dispositivo após a auditoria, porque eu queria ter uma, alguma coisa factual da parte deles que confirmasse as minhas suspeitas que eu tinha, que eu tinha conseguido uh, usurpar durante a auditoria. Portanto, a resposta deles é, vocês vão reparar, só para terem ideia, reparem naquele último D, e aquilo é um R, a primeira, a primeira letra, mas é um último D. E eu perguntei-lhes onde é que estavam os certificados que eles usavam para comunicar para a SSL, e, e eles disseram, os certificados estão na pasta X e a password é aquela. Portanto, aquilo era a password do certificado de cliente que eles estavam a usar quando queriam instalar. E eu, eu, a primeira pergunta que eu coloco é, tipo, quem é que usa logo a password de hardcoded não executável? Isso era, tipo, impensável. A password era a mesma password, eles só emitiram um set de certificados e era sempre a mesma private key. Era mesmo, sempre a mesma. O que, o que quer dizer que durante o design da solução, alguém fez questão de falhar nesta parte da segurança. Portanto, não havia um set de keys para cada, para cada certificado. Ou seja, vamos todos, é sempre a mesma password para todos os certificados, o que me deu automaticamente a, a ideia de, ok, vamos instalar o certificado noutra máquina e tentar perceber uh, se eu consigo chegar até ao back-end. Instalei o certificado, como podem ver ali, uh, e este era o back-end. Ele não podia password nem nada. A partir do momento em que o cliente tivesse o, aquele certificado, tivesse instalado na máquina, ele, ele, faz, ele recria o certificado, abria a, a sua ligação e isto era o primeiro ecrã que vocês viram. Este não tinha outro tipo de ecrã. Quando chegavam ao IP do back-end, este era o único ecrã que vocês tinham. Mais uma vez, não havia o conceito de perfis. Portanto, ou entrava como administrador ou entrava como administrador. Não havia, tipo... <risos> Não havia uma segunda opção. Uh, continuando, porque isto é, é, um, é um ciclo catastrófico de erros seguidos. Mas, uh, eu, neste momento, eu não, como vocês sabem, era um teste black box, eu não tinha o melhor conhecimento de como é que funcionava a plataforma. Portanto, da minha parte, eu não sei como é que se geram números, não sei como é que os números são, como é que é, a nível de logs, como é que é possível gerar um número e não ser uh, identificado como a um, um sorteio ad hoc. Eu não tinha nenhum tipo de informação. Então, o que é que eu fiz? Fiquei à escuta durante... Criei, fui ver os, server, os service logs e basicamente a única coisa que eu estava a fazer era ver estes servos que vocês estão, estão aqui estava a ver o que é que acontecia, qual é que era o processo e tentava identificar nos menus uh, os nomes, a ver se foram parecidos ou não para eu tentar perceber qual é que é o processo do, do sorteio o que eu identifiquei foi que existia, a primeira coisa que tinha que ser feita que o programa perguntava porque estava a nulo era as regras eu presumo que as regras sejam usadas hoje em dia para definir populações do género imaginem que vocês vendem Uh, 7 milhões de tickets para aquela lotaria, mas por acaso identificaram que havia, havia um erro e tinham que eliminar daquele, daquele sorteio um milhão. E desse um milhão pode ir para as regras, pode dizer tipo, valem todos menos estes. E, e identificam com as expressões lógicas qual é o, o range ou o, especificamente o, o bilhete que vocês querem eliminar da, do sorteio. Uh, no entanto, depois de eu perceber isso, existia um problema muito maior, que existe uma, uma fase do sorteio, que é, o sorteio só é válido após o júri classificar o sorteio como válido. O que uh, limita imenso o trabalho de uma pessoa, no caso o atacante, o hacker, porque é um fator humano que tem que ser ultrapassado. Porque ele tem que, aparece-lhe um pop-up com todas as, as regras e com todos os um, fatores do sorteio que têm que ser uh, analisados, e, e o, neste caso o número já está gerado, ele seleciona o número e diz, ok, o processo foi válido e carrega ok, só aí é que é validado. Uh, eu aqui ainda não sabia, porque se eu mudasse o número durante, se eu chegasse a esta parte e ele traça ali, não nas regras, porque as regras nunca são vistas, mas se eu alterasse durante o sorteio o número, ele percebia logo que tinha sido uma falha. Se eu, se eu, se eu alterasse o que lhe aparecia no ecrã, alguém ia reparar nos logs. Portanto, aqui tinha algum problema. Até que eu percebi que, na verdade, a única coisa que eles faziam sempre skip era a, as regras de exclusão. E aqui é só um processo de lógica, portanto, a única coisa que eles nunca tinham pensado, e eu cheguei a fazer esta pergunta aos developers da solução, eles nunca equacionaram que alguém dissesse que, uh, nos, na, na, em vez de ser nas regras inválidas, nas regras válidas, que alguém dissesse assim, são todos inválidos menos o meu número. <risos> nunca ninguém se lembrou que isso podia ser uma opção, porque, logicamente, ninguém faz isso, tipo, isso era manipular o sorteio de uma forma maligna. <risos> Foi, e esta foi a frase, ele disse que não era um bug, era uma feature. Era uma feature, atenção. E eu disse, oh, espetáculo. Porque uma coisa que eu descobri ao longo de tantas auditorias é, às vezes, 
Alguém já criou uma feature para fazer exatamente aquilo que nós queremos e que a empresa não quer. Mas já existe. Essa feature já existe. Só ainda não sabemos. Então, o que é que eu fiz? A primeira coisa de todas, tinha que jogar. Tinha que comprar um, um ticket que tivesse um, um número qualquer. E eu escolhi, uh, basicamente, foi, foi o, que, o que me deram, foi este. Tinha aquele valor, esta foi a expressão. E eu esperei que, eu, que existisse o, o sorteio de testes, que, que obviamente não podia fazer no de produção, senão não estava aqui, estava nas Maldivas. Mas uh, o que interessa é, eu esperei tipo, no sorteio de testes, que acontece sempre 6 horas antes, e efetuei o primeiro teste. E o primeiro teste foi, the winning number era o meu, o meu número. Esta altura foi quando eu disse ao meu chefe que havia um problema sério. Tipo, porque eu até lá achava que aquilo estava a ser divertido só. Uh, <risos> E, e quando eu cheguei a esta fase, basicamente já era uma, um concretizar de, daquilo que eu tinha feito. Porque eu fui ver os logs e os logs diziam que era completamente válido. Não, em nenhum momento o júri olha para os logs, porque os, os logs são definidos antes do júri ver. Mesmo quando ele está no pop-up, não lhe aparece lá as regras, porque podem ser muito extensas. Tem lá um link a dizer, se quiser ver, e claro que ele não, não, não clica. Isso não, isso não acontece. Uh, e, no caso, isto tudo é importante, uh, este ciclo catastrófico que eu vos mostrei de chegar até a um valor tão alto de prémio, porque em nenhum momento vocês viram a segurança aqui como um processo. Por exemplo, havia uma password porque tinha que existir, não havia tipo uma fase de... Um, nunca houve um, uma segurança como um processo, nunca houve desde o princípio ao fim, alguém que olhou e pensou tipo, ok, neste processo vamos só olhar tipo, se existem segurança nas passwords, onde é que estão, se alguém fez art de credentials, se alguém tipo, já fez uma auditoria ao sistema. Nunca ouvi isso até ao fim. Portanto, isto é depois de entregarem ao cliente, e o cliente, neste caso, que era a empresa que eu estava a representar, teve a, a, a clareza de pensar, antes de pormos isto mesmo em produção, vamos fazer um teste. E, e foi este o resultado. Um, pá, e basicamente é, é a apresentação. Uh, obrigado por terem ouvido, não sei se... O Security by Design, posso dizer que em Portugal, das poucas empresas, ou a única empresa que eu vi que tinha, que tinha a segurança by design, ou seja, desde mas eu estou a falar da minha experiência, claro. Só tive conhecimento, talvez, da, da que eu conheço a nível de segurança mais elevada, é a CIBS, de longe, em que é uma empresa que verifica a solução desde o início. Desde o início tem, tem a equipa de segurança a acompanhar. Eu só não vejo isso mais vezes, porque eu acho que também é uma culpa um bocado nossa, nossa das pessoas que fazem auditorias, dos penetration testers, dos code reviewers, etc., que fazem questão de entrar na segurança ou entrar com os developers em conversas de, em sessões de culpabilização, em que eles dizem, ah, erraste, e a pessoa está ali a ser chicoteada durante 30 minutos, porque, porque, não, porque não teve as noções, e etc. E só vai lá, tipo, com a empresa a acreditar que a segurança só entra em cima do negócio, não entra lá para quebrar o negócio, não é... Não é um, um dealer breaker, é mais um, um dealer sustain. E, e acho que todos nós temos que ter aquela flexibilidade e eu acho que vem do conhecimento. E, e eu, eu sonho que talvez no futuro as pessoas nas universidades saiam já com vontade de fazer alguma coisa em segurança para podermos criar um, um público uh, muito mais consciente daquilo que está a acontecer. Porque daqui para a frente, uh, nós só, Portugal só pode evoluir no panorama que já existe nos outros países se toda a gente estiver on board naquilo que existe a nível de segurança. E para isso é acreditar que nós, na segurança, só vamos ajudar o um negócio. E quando, isso, quando as pessoas meterem na cabeça que a segurança só ajuda o um negócio, então toda a gente adota a segurança como um fator bom. Uh, depois demoraram... Uh... <risos> Demoraram, sabe, por acaso essa do depois é uma ótima pergunta. Sabe, a primeira, a primeira, o primeiro fix que eles fizeram foi fazer blacklist dos IPs que, de, que estavam a aceder ao back-end. E eu perguntei porque é que não era uma whitelist. Eles disseram porque a blacklist era mais rápida. Então, o que era interessante, mas eu disse que se calhar não funciona, se calhar não funcionava. E depois, 
Só depois de eu lhes mostrar que continuava a dar para, para usurpar a segurança, é que foram ao code e tiraram as, as credenciais lá hardcoded, e depois foram emitir novos certificados, e etc. E acabaram por desenhar uma solução. Repare, só para terem uma ideia, a solução que é vendida, que, que vocês viram agora aqui, é uma solução que é vendida às lotarias, como, como vocês viram, exatamente como está, por 10 milhões de euros. Custa 10 milhões de euros ter aquela lotaria. Assim, como ela está com o device, a arquitetura, o back-end, são 10 milhões de euros em que nos foi dito que não existe nem alocado nenhum, nenhum por cento do budget para segurança. Portanto, nem os developers, nem os administradores, nem as pessoas que vendem os shells, nunca ninguém teve conhecimento que se calhar era importante o fator... Porque eles presumiam que a empresa que ia fazer qualquer coisa no meio. Mas não, era a solução que estava em erro. Não, não. Não, já tinha, vi, já tinha visto noutras situações, mas não no sentido em que eles sabiam que aquela password era as chaves para o, para, o, para o castelo e mesmo assim nem sequer. É porque, mesmo que eu não percebesse nada e que a password tivesse, sei lá, em vez de estar nas strings eu tinha que fazer um decode qualquer, tinha que fazer um processo mais elaborado. Eu acho que não há nenhum, nenhum fator em que eu achava que devia estar ali. Porque mostrava-me, eu, eu soube, eu só soube, a primeira coisa que eu, que eu associei a nível da password private key foi porque eu vi SSL ready, SSL server, SSL certificate. O, o seguimento do código dizia-me que aquilo só podia ser aquela password. Exato. Força. Há aí vários desafios. Sistema, desenvolvimento, ninguém deve ser gerente de acessibilidade ou nenhuma segurança. Todos os developers usam a sistema de segurança. Sistema, até isso. É que está aí um canal de... É catastrófico. É, é, exato. É, este resultado, eu, eu acho que o valor de... de o negócio, do, neste caso era o da lotaria, mas podia ser o brand damage, etc., é tão alto porque falhou tudo ao longo do, do processo. A única coisa certa foi alguém que era responsável da segurança disse, antes de, de colocar isto mesmo 100% live, já existiam alguns sorteios de teste, mas vamos só deixar tipo, o Luís fazer um teste para ver como é que é. E esse senhor que está ao seu lado geralmente fazia sempre isso comigo, deixava-me testar as coisas antes de, eu, antes de passar a produção. Portanto, basicamente, foi só... Foi só mas eu, eu, eu depois comuniquei com, com, a outra, com outro país que tinha a solução e, uh, só para ter uma ideia, eles só tiveram conhecimento que iam ser... Porque aquilo depois existe um, uma, uma conferência onde vão todas as lotarias. Eles só souberam que existiam fixos prontos para, para o dispositivo que eles tinham depois de eu falar com eles, porque a empresa também não comunicou com eles a dizer que havia um fixo. Porque acho que era um bocado daquele jogo que se eu disser que está mal, pois eles vão dizer que nós não fizemos bem. Então existe aquele medo de também estar errado, o que é negativo. Mais uma pergunta. Um, há um ponto chave para poder fazer o que fez, não é? Que é ter acesso ao ponto de rede. Certo. E eu lá, e eu tenho muita rede, certo. por acaso até lá estão está toda essa máquina montada. Exato. Uh, isso não foi complicado. Aqui. Há estranho. Não havia 802-1x, era. era... Sim, tinha uma tomada de ali, um tinha, de ali. tinha várias, tinha, tinha três. Portanto, um uma, duas. Aquela era, era só uma. Aquilo era uma flat network. É tudo um único segmento de rede para tudo. Certo. certo. É fantástico. É fantástico, é, exato. Essa é a palavra. 10 milhões de euros são só. Exato. Está aqui. Está aqui. Ok, obrigado. Graças. Foi, foi diferente, não foi? Foi, foi. Só para. Espera aí, não, na verdade não é preciso. Espera aí, faz assim, assim. 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 Já está. Sim, sim, força.
decoration of the rooms. Uh, Andras Hikloni uh, will introduce us the uh, newest developments, enhancing information sharing among the CISAR community. Uh, for those who don't know MISP, MISP is malware information sharing platform, shares uh, indicators of compromise. Uh, indicators of compromise, I hope it's not a bad comparison, but it's like a signature of malware that spread, we spread among each other to detect the, the malware in the, in the network, in the computer, and something like this. Uh, Andras is the MISP main developer, uh, and he's a firm believer that there are no problems that cannot be tackled by building the right tool. I hope MISP is the best tool. <laughs> yeah, hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, hello everyone. Uh, first of all, who here has used MISP or who here knows MISP already? Okay, we have a few in the audience. Uh, so, what we're going to do mostly today is I'm just going to talk a little bit about what has changed over the past year or so in MISP. So, it's been going on for a while. But before I start, just a quick explanation of what MISP is, just for the people that haven't seen it before. So, indeed, it's basically, it, it started out as an IOC uh, database and a threat sharing platform. Uh, but it has since evolved to other uh, areas as well, such as financial fraud, information sharing, higher level threat intel sharing, and so on. But basically, it is free and open source software. So if you're interested in it, just go and grab it, play around with it, and so on. Uh, it has a host of functionalities that are supposed to help you, the users, uh, and your community to exchange this information. So things uh, such as uh, uh, automatic correlation of the data, uh, easy tools to ingest all the data from various sources to just paste reports and so on and get your indicators out of them. All of these tools are provided by MISP. And of course, it tries to help make use of all this information that you have in feeding your various devices in all of these formats and more. I'm not going to go through the whole list. Uh, it's not exhaustive. Uh, just have a look at the application itself if, you, if you're interested in what exactly it supports. Uh, the application itself is split into separate parts. We try to make it as accommodating as possible for users that want to enhance it, to build their own tools around it. So we have the core uh, project, which is the core of the application that includes the UI, the APIs, all the ACL and everything behind it. Uh, generally, if you want to extend MISP, you don't ever have to touch that part. What you have to worry about is modules, which is import and export connectors, lookup modules, and so on. What, uh, different ways for you to enhance uh, what kind of data goes in there and what comes out of there. And then we have the taxonomies, warning lists, and galaxies. So these are basically uh, metadata structures that uh, are uh, you, uh, using a shared repository uh, to feed all this information into MISP. So those are things that you can also extend. For example, uh, taxonomies are ways to describe the data that you already have in there. This could be either releasability information or classification information, or just simply grouping uh, the data into various uh, sub subgroups based on various aspects. We're going to have a look at some of the new ones, so that should clarify it a little bit more. Warning lists are tools that allow you to avoid false positives. So these are things that will warn you uh, if you've entered something that's an obvious false positive, for example, if you're entering a, a, the hash of an empty file, MISP will scream at you that this is something that is probably a false positive, it's an empty file. And galaxies are our higher level th uh, threat intel uh, structures, such as threat actors, uh, descriptions of uh, ransomware, and so on. So we have also a bigger list of different types of objects that we support in there. But we'll look a little, little bit more uh, in a bit at that. So. The question is, what has changed over the past year? So MISP has been going on since 2012, and activity is just going up and up with the development in it. So a lot has been happening since then. So let's look at some of the things that have changed. One of the big changes in MISP is that whilst before MISP was meant to exchange data from a MISP uh, installation to another MISP installation within your community, uh, we now opened up to different ways of ingesting data. So one of the most obvious choices were feeds. So that means that if you're already subscribing to various paid feeds or if you're using OSIN feeds out there, you can hook them up directly to MISP and it will fetch the data from there and store it in your database. Another thing that we did with that was that we also allowed MISP formatted data to be shared without MISP to MISP interaction. So if you are uh, producing data, you can directly produce it in a MISP format, exchange it that way. Or if you have air-gapped systems that you want to exchange information with, this is uh, actually something that comes up quite often. Uh, then you can use this system for that. 
Uh, and one of the, the interesting things with this is that normally when you're ingesting a feed that is out there, it's kind of a black box until you actually handle the data and until you look at it. But what MIST tries to do is be, even while you're importing it, you can browse that data in advance. It will consolidate that data into a format that you already know, MIST's own data, before importing it. You can cherry pick the data that you're interested in. You can see correlations without actually getting it into your database and see if this is something valuable to you or not. Uh, and we took this idea and moved it a little bit further recently. And we, uh, we figured, why would users want to import all of that data? Sometimes you have millions of indicators out there from various feeds that might be interesting or might be not for correlation reasons and so on. And until now, users had to import it into their MISP. So what we try to do now is we allow the caching of these feeds without directly importing it. So that means that all the values are ripped out of these feeds. They are stored in Redis, and you can do fast lookups against it. So that means that if you have your sane IOC data set that is curated by your community, you will immediately see that some of that data correlates to data that's out there in these various feeds that you might not want to directly ingest but still want to keep track of. And this brought us to an, another thing. Having seen MLSEC's uh, presentation on the TIQ test, which compares the various feeds and feed overlaps, and is meant to, be, uh, to allow you to, to quantify and to put value on the various feeds compared to one another, so you don't buy black boxes, uh, we figure this is a very nice idea and we should do something kind of similar. So what we allow to do now is to compare the overlap between the various feeds. So it's a good idea for, uh, to ask for a, a proof of concept from a feed vendor. Just check it out with feed, cache it, see how it compares to all those OSINT feeds that you're using, and you might find that it's not really worth buying. So I'm very sorry to all the feed providers out there. If you're repackaging, if, it's, if you're not, then it's great. <laughs> so this is what the feed comparison matrix looks like with a few of the feeds loaded. You can see that there are uh, uh, the percentage of overlap between the various feeds. So right now you can see it on top. If you hover over any of those numbers, it corresponds to, the, uh, to a feed from this list. So yeah, it's a nifty feature for evaluating what kind of data you want to actually work with. So moving on, uh, another thing that we have noticed over the recent uh, year is that we had a huge uptick of users. So uh, as, at Circle, we run our own communities, and we have a total of 700 organizations that are interacting with us through MISP. Uh, with a total of 1,500 users. And this is just our community. There are many other communities out there that we interact with indirectly. Uh, and the amount of data being pushed around became massive. The amount of, uh, of these organizations that are querying MIS via the, uh, the, uh, the API and so on became more and more of a burden. So one of the things that we've tried to do as of uh, late is to speed things up a little bit uh, to get around this issue. It's a constant challenge of a ver uh, with a very active community out there, and especially with things such as this popping up. So this is WannaCry, and as you can see, uh, these are just some of the e uh, events in MISP that uh, have WannaCry indicators and that are correlating with one another. It's a huge amount of data. And of course, we also had things like this. This is the Grizzly Step report correlating to all of the uh, APT28 events out there and to all of the Tor exit nodes up there. But that's a different question. Uh, so as you can see, it's a lot of data that we've suddenly uh, started seeing being uh, shared, which led to a lot of uh, performance issues at first. So we've been working with uh, improving uh, the performance. We've, uh, we've introduced new caching mechanisms, and we try to be smart about some of the things that we're doing, a lot of database debugging. So we're now up to 10, 15 times the speed that we were a month or, or two ago. So if you're using MISP and you're below version 2.4.74, uh, it's really worth upgrading because you're going to get a huge performance boost. OK. So another thing that has happened over the past year was, uh, was we introduced sightings. So people were sharing information through MISP about all these indicators that they've seen in their net networks, that they've done uh, analysis on, and so on. But one of the things that we were missing from the puzzle for collaboration was being able to say that I've seen that too. So this is a sighting. Uh, so initially, we had a, a project that was funded by the Dutch NCSC to introduce sightings to MISP, which was basically saying, I've seen it too. And since then, we've taken this uh, approach and expanded it quite a bit further by, by opening it up to the API to set various uh, additional parameters, such as what has seen this in my network? Was it uh, Honeypot that has seen it? Was it uh, my IDS that has seen it? 
and also to be able to flag false positives. So if someone has seen it in their network, but it's a confirmed false positive, they should be able to signal that too. And we have a third aspect to sightings that kind of belongs to this category of false positives, which is being able to say that this is an indicator that I believe will not be valid after this uh, given date. So basically an expiration for all of these uh, attributes. So yeah. Um, yeah, so this is one of the things that just popped up recently. And as you can see, you can take all this data and draw conclusions out of the, the citing information. So for example, if you have uh, a threat actor that you are tracking via various events, uh, then you will see on the threat actor, or on this case on a, a ransomware like WannaCry itself, when it was active and uh, in your community. So the interesting thing with that is, and what we're hoping to do in the future, is to be able to correlate uh, the various attacks based on time as well, so not direct indicators. But if things line up well uh, when they're happening, it might be an interesting tell that, some, that there are some, is some relation between those things. So this is something that is ongoing and that we're already deployed and waiting for the results to come in from the various uh, sightings that the community provides. Okay. So I've already touched a little bit on the galaxies, so let's have a look at what actually changed there. So galaxies are our higher level threat intel information that we attach to all of these information packages. This can be something as simple as a threat actor with all of the relevant curated data that, that we have in our repository about them, or preventative me measures, or as of recent, uh, recently we have a, 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 a something that we call galaxy that, uh, uh, about rats. So if you're interested in, uh, in any of that, uh, it's on GitHub. You can interact with it, and you can use it in other tools as well. So if you, it, this is completely separate from MISP, and you can reuse it in whatever tool you're using to keep the naming uh, and the uh, information intact between the various tools. Yeah, and uh, uh, the whole thing is just a very simple JSON format. So if you want to work on it and expand it, just go to GitHub, do a pull request if you see anything um, uh, missing there or anything wrong in there, and we'll have a look at it. So this is what uh, an actual Galaxy looks uh, like. So this is uh, one, uh, WannaCry again. The whole, whole idea is that these are structures that are key value based, unlike all the indicator data and all the technical measures. These are meant for human injection, so to say. So it will be an analyst looking at it. So we, we were a little bit more loose on how, how we defi uh, define these structures. In this case, we have, uh, for WannaCry, a description, various synonyms. Uh, uh, you can set a source, uh, the authors that worked on it, and so on. So it's pretty straightforward. OK. And uh, yeah, uh, if you're interested in that, just go to this URL and have a look at uh, the various galaxies that we already have in there and play around with them. And yeah, open up GitHub issues if you see anything missing. So taxonomies are something similar to galaxies, in, uh, but they're basically classification schemes that are also held in a, uh, in a centralized repository that are meant to classify the information that you have in there. Uh, so uh, basically, the idea is, is very similar uh, to, to galaxies, that we, that we have a central repository that you contribute to. Uh, this is also something that, uh, that is an ongoing uh, project with the mapping of these various taxonomies. So you have, for example, various ways to describe source reliability, depending on which community you're in. We try to keep this um, uh, separate for each of those known vocabularies that are out there instead of mixing it to the, together and saying it's going to be a 1 to, uh, to 100 range because we cannot seem to convert people to using a given other uh, vocabulary than they're using in their community anyway. So what we're trying to do now is we're trying to take all of these various things out there and trying to find mappings between them and then have that applied by MIST directly. If you're interested in joining the effort for mapping this, uh, this data, just go to GitHub and join the, uh, join the community that's been built around that. So this is another interesting thing that has popped up uh, over the last year, and this is in relation to the financial sector. I don't know if there are any representatives of financial sector organizations in here? No, not at all, wow. <laughs> so basically, uh, one of the things that is very different with information sharing when it comes to, financial, to the financial sector is they generally do not want their name attached to the information that they're sharing because it could hurt their reputation. So one of the things that, uh, that we got as a request was to be able to share this information anonymously. 
And uh, we came up with this idea that it should be a third party taking over the information that is being shared. So it is delegated to a third party that will release it under their own name. And then it is shared with the community. And the reason for that is and, well, and because originally a lot of these organizations said, OK, we don't want to share this information at all since it might hurt us. But once we got this system, uh, they quickly figured out that sharing this information means that they might get corrections, feedback, and so on on the data that without having the risk of exposing that they might have been the one that was breached potentially by it, uh, they still got the benefits of. So for example, uh, in, with what we've seen in some of the countries was that um, a national organization that, like an ISAC that is sitting on top of the financial sector would take care of all of these delegations and it would be them that was contacted with the data and they would release it under their name and then it was out there and people could contribute back to it. Um, yeah. So another thing uh, that has changed recently was, if, if anyone has used MIST before, one of the most handy features and one of the ones that was the most well hidden in the interface uh, was something that we call the free text import, where you just paste a blob of text with various indicators from a report or whatever in there, and MIST will try to figure out what kind of indicators are actually in that document. This is very handy if, if you have uh, people sending uh, you PDF reports instead of something well formatted in a MIS format, OpenIOC, or some other format that can be ingested more easily by a machine. Uh, and the idea here is to rip all of that out and uh, go through the process that your analyst would normally have to do for inserting it. Uh, and one of the things that we did recently was open this up to the API. So that means that if you have any tool out there that is producing indicators in whatever format and you don't want to deal with it, or if you, uh, for example, one of the things that we're doing now is we have a tool called mail to misp that basically takes emails or, or accepts emails and set, passes the data on directly to MISP and it imports it using the free text import or whatever was in there. So it rips out all the indicators and generates events out of the, those for you. And then you can later on review the data that was created in MISP. Okay, so this is basically what, uh, what we call the, the integration pipeline of MISP looks like. It's a simplified image of tools that connect with MISP that MISP takes data from. So for example, if you have analysts that are using Viper, uh, or, uh, reverse engineers that are using Viper, I don't know if anyone is using it in here. No? OK. So yeah, basically, then you can just directly connect, uh, hook that up to MISP and interact with the data directly uh, and push the results to MISP. Same thing with sandboxes. You, can, uh, you have various integration for Cuckoo Sandbox, Joe Sandbox, and so on, where you can directly push data uh, to MISP uh, from your sandbox results, and so on. Uh, and then we have various tools that deal with uh, taking the data that's already in MISP and enriching it, interacting with it. And on the right side, we have various tools and uh, standards that deal with the data that you have in MISP and taking it to your protective devices and feeding those. So for example, if you're, for your IDSs, you can feed them directly with MISP data in Suricata or Snort format, or Bro format, and so on. Okay. So, what has changed here recently was we've teamed up with the Hive project, which uh, for incident response, it, I highly recommend that anyone that is using MIST to have a look at it. They do some really cool stuff and they've fully integrated uh, the Hive with MISP so you can get data directly into their system from MISP, interact with it, push the data back to MISP. Uh, and, uh, they also have something called Cortex, which they use for enriching the data that they have in MISP. And we had something called MISP modules that did something similar. So we had a hackathon with them where we figured, OK, let's exchange those tools that we have. And now you can actually use uh, Cortex directly in MISP. And you can use the MISP modules directly in the Hive. So you can make use of all of these uh, enrichment tools uh, by using either of those tools. Another uh, thing that is interesting is if you're doing threat hunting and uh, you want to use MISP as your central database using it together with McAfee Open, the Excel, McAfee has built integration with that. There is a very nice uh, blog post explaining how it works, which is in this link. Uh, so make sure you have a look at that. It's, it's really nifty. Okay, so going back to the Hive, here is a small diagram of how it all works. So if you have MISP, the Hive, and Cortex, uh, basically, uh, the Hive and MISP exchange, uh, uh, or, or, or Hive uses the, the, the MISP uh, event data that is in there, and, and both of those tools uh, can uh, 
use the uh, Cortex analyzers to enrich the data. Okay. So moving on, another thing that we, we still kind of lacked, we, even uh, with this split of the MISP core uh, project, the MISP modules and all the JSON formats, was still a way for, uh, for users to inject the, their own scripts into the whole workflow of MISP. So ingesting data, creating data, enriching data. Uh, and what we figured would be the most sensible thing to do is to use uh, zero MQ, uh, pub sub uh, system, uh, to take the data that is being published through MISP, so that could be event data, citing data, user data, even discussions, and directly push it uh, through zero MQ to whatever tools are sitting on the same machine and ingesting it. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in writing scripts for that, it's super easy to use in Python. There is a sample uh, script out there that you can reuse. So you can do whatever with any data that goes in directly in real time this way. Uh, and this was also uh, uh, designed with models such as CSP in mind. So this is something that, uh, that is under uh, discu uh, discussion and that we'll get back to later on that we want to, in to integrate MISP with other tools in a seamless way and just push the data out there locally to all of these other tools. And if you have any other um, uh, ideas on, uh, on, uh, on how, th how this design would fit into your uh, community's model, it's super easy to implement it for yourself. Okay, so this is what has happened recently. So let's talk a little bit about what is going to happen soon in MISP or what is underway. So one of the biggest things that's been coming for, uh, to MISP for a while, and it's hopefully out very soon, is the, uh, what we call MISP objects. So one of the things that we've noticed was that MISP has a very flat structure when it comes to the indicators. It means that what we call events, those are our, our metadata containers around the data that is being shared, are populated by attributes. And these attributes can be uh, indicators of compromise. They can be various resources, such as information about vulnerabilities, uh, financial fraud information and so on. But what we lacked was a way to group all of these uh, things into, uh, into objects. For example, if you have hashes, file names and so on, and you have a larger list of things that describe a file, it should be, uh, should be groupable into a file object. So this is something that we've been working on for a while, defining all of these objects that should go in there. And the system that we have come up with in the end would be a hybrid system of, of predefined objects that we're defining and a templating system that allows you to create objects on the fly uh, and share those with other users. Of course, having the downside that the integration of those uh, uh, templated uh, objects would not be as uh, thorough as, uh, into the various export formats unless someone adopts it uh, to the export modules. So this is a community effort. We've been working together with various parties that uh, have the most insight into those various objects. Uh, the whole thing is on GitHub. So if you want to interact with us and have ideas or see something that's obviously wrong that we did, just let us know and we'll fix it and work together with you to uh, change it. OK. Some more things that are coming. Uh, we currently have a discussion system in MISP. But one of the things we notice is people want to be able to say that I want to add information to this thing here, pointing at an attribute or whatever field in an event is interesting to them or to a tag. So we want an adaptation system for our discussions. That means that you'll be able to insert uh, uh, comments to various parts of the event, and those would show up as an overlay when enabled to the analyst. Uh, so it will be a little bit more interactive the way you, uh, you discuss what you're actually sharing with the other users out there. Okay. Another thing that we want to do is geolocations. We want to take all those IP addresses, domains, and so on, and get geolocation information, store those uh, in a Redis cache, and, be, uh, and allow you to be able to search the, uh, the data and group the data based on uh, geolocation. So it is something straightforward. I don't know why we haven't done it earlier. It's one of those things that comes up in discussions every now and then, and then we forget about it. But now it's happening, it seems. <laughs> OK. So moving on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, this is an, uh, another p thing that we want to do for, uh, for the collaboration aspect. So we, we have ha uh, introduced a lot of ways for people to say that this information is wrong uh, in this package, this information could be enhanced, but something very simple was missing and it's the ability to request information. So I have a sample, I don't have the capability to do reverse engineering, 
uh, but I still would like to see what's actually in there. And I have a community that I have access to that I want to be able to ask. So we came up with this idea of request objects where you can put out an event there with some information and ask for additional information from your community. And hopefully, someone will be able to provide it. And then it would just show up uh, to the other users that this is something that is expecting additional information. Um, yeah. And then we have the, this whole Mist Next Generation project that is part of Ceph that is go, uh, ongoing right now with a huge list of defined um, new things that are coming. A lot of that is already covered in what I said before, but a lot of it isn't. So that, that, uh, that is also something that is happening in the near future. So basically, uh, MISP is a, is a tool that is supposed to help you with information sharing. Uh, the idea is not to get in your way and to adopt your practices and to make it as, um, uh, as hidden from uh, your analysts as possible when they're interacting with it. There are many users out there that will use MIST without ever touching MIST directly through other tools that they interact with, and that's perfectly fine with us. It's just a tool that is supposed to make your life easier. The whole thing comes from usage and uh, sharing practices. So we ourselves are massive users of MISP. So, uh, we kind of eat our own dog food here, and uh, we build it based on what we're seeing, what our community sees, and what the interaction is with that. So yeah, and we want to be able to give you the, uh, the tools to customize MISP in a way that makes more sense for your organization or your community. Uh, if you want to play with it, just go download uh, it from GitHub. Uh, if you want access to uh, the Circle community, uh, all you need to do is tell us who you are, send us a PGP key, and you're most likely eligible to join. So just let us know if you're interested in it. Uh, if there is anything th that's missing in, in MISP completely and you cannot uh, use a module for it or uh, just uh, extend the JSON, let us know about it. Or if you have the coding ca capabilities for it, just implement a pull request. We, we really love those. Uh, or just uh, yeah, open up GitHub issues and so on. It's also possible to co-fund some projects with us. If we see that it makes sense for us, we also jump into those and uh, throw resources at it together with some third parties. We did that with the sightings and so on. So that's an option too. But yeah, uh, any ideas, pull requests, and so on are mo more than welcome. Uh, if you are running a MISP, make sure that you uh, follow our Twitter account because that's where we release all the information about what's coming, what's out there now, whenever we do a release, or whenever we get a security uh, report where we have to fix something, we also announce it there right after so that you know that you're running an up-to-date and secure MISP. And that's basically it. So if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, MISP is uh, mm -hmm. by far the mm -hmm. biggest application in the C -Cert community. Okay. Every C -Cert is just, uh, why do you think the MISP mm -hmm. comes from? Where does this success come from? I, I think it's, uh, w what makes it easy for us is that we're users of it, and the people that we interact with are also users for it. So usually when you see something new pop up in MISP, it's based on our own frustration with something missing in there. So that makes it very, very natural for us to extend it in a way that makes sense for the CSER community. So, yeah. <laughs> Are there any more questions? No. Okay. All right. <laughs>
So uh, welcome to the last session of the day. It will be spoken in English. Uh, it will be given by Gerardo Vigier, uh, the responsible for uh, RIPE uh, Network Coordination Center uh, training. Uh, and we will give some tools that are used usually for the ISPs, uh, but in this case, uh, the scope is law enforcement. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, welcome everybody. My name is Gerardo Vivier. I work for the Training Services Department of the RIPE NCC. How many of you know what the RIPE NCC is? One, two. Okay, half the room. The rest uh, have no idea. That's good. Um, what we're going to be talking about is these tools and services that we operate. And like uh, he said, they're mostly geared toward the network operators. But there's information in uh, these databases and tools that we run that can be useful for law enforcement agencies when you're trying to do an investigation. But first of all, let's clarify some things. On the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog. Actually, on the internet, everybody is just a virtual thing. Uh, the internet is just a series of machines that are connected to each other, and they're exchanging packets and information. So what you can find in uh, the data and in the services and tools that we operate is just information of these machines that are exchanging packets over the whole internet. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is show you that you can try to find these machines, or at least we're going to give you somewhere to start to look for these machines. And once you've found them, where, once you've found where the device or the network is located, you can try to find who is operating these devices or networks. So who we are, we're the RIPE uh, Network Coordination Center. RIPE is actually a short thing for Réseau IP Européen. Long story short, it's the people who got together at the beginning of the 80s and decided how to set some rules and, and policies on how to run the internet from an administrative point of view. We're located in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. We're a not-for-profit organization. We don't make money, we spend it. <laughs> and we're one of the five regional internet registries in the world, with around 16,000 members at the time. What we do is distribute IPv4, IPv6, and AS numbers. We operate RIPE database. We give support to the RIPE community, the people who are discussing these policies on how to distribute IPs and operate the internet. We run RIPE stat, RIPE atlas, and resource certification, which are some of the services that we provide. We provide training courses and come to speak at events like this, and many other good uh, things for the good of the internet. Um, all of you are familiar with IPs and ASNs, right? Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to go start, jump over this, how a TCP IP network works, packet switching all over the place. I wonder if I can go faster. Uh, one second, I'm just going to skip that slide. You have IPv4, IPv6, network interfaces, network address translation. You all know how network address translation works. You have autonomous systems, which are groups of networks or networks that exchange information. So the packets flow between these uh, different autonomous systems. That's why we have AS numbers. Um, announcements, when an announcement is made, uh, a certain network says we have these IPs and then the traffic flows towards that autonomous system. Announcements work sort of like this. Every autonomous system announces what they have, and then uh, they share this routing information all over the internet, and so the traffic flows from one autonomous system to the other to reach those IP addresses. You know, traffic direction is different than the uh, announcement. And this brings us then to the first part of our uh, actual um, presentation. To understand how to best use the data and tools that we have, uh, it's probably good to establish what kind of goals it is that we want to achieve. What are we trying to do? Are we trying to find the person who's operating the computer, who's doing the bad things? Or are we trying to first find out what's happening? Um, that's why I had that subtitle. Is that a clue or is it just an IP address? If you have information, like an IP address or some kind of packet, which has information about an IP address, you can't really do much with that. You want to find where that IP address is configured, and if that's not maybe a man in the middle who's doing something. 
Um, if I say the Internet Registry, what do you think it is? Any idea? You know. <laughs> well, um, it's not like an address book that tells you where an IP is located, but it's more like an address book that tells you who is responsible for distributing those IP addresses. Normally, you would have this ideal situation in your head. When you talk about the Internet Registry, it's all really nice, neat. Um, somebody has a block of IPs and distributes it to somebody else, and that somebody else distributes it further, and everybody does their homework, and of course, it all looks pretty neat. But the reality is different, because um, what we have planned on the administrative side, how we distribute things or how we register things, is not always matching with what's happening in reality in the data centers. Uh, it's very important to take this into account because what you're going to see in the database or in the tools that we find uh, that we operate is neat. It's nice. It's all nice and tidy. You have to correlate that with what's happening for real in the networks of the people who are operating the internet. So let's take a quick look at the internet ecosystem. Uh, ICANN, you all know ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. They uh, sort of handle the whole internet numbers and names uh, um, operations. The ICANN operates directly all what's TLDs, domain names, and the IANA makes sure that numbers like IPs and ASNs are distributed to the five different regional uh, internet registries. And from there, it goes down to the network operators. These are the five RAR service regions. We operate this one, so Europe, Middle East, and what used to be all the Soviet Union. You have APNIC operating what's Southeast Asia and the Pacific, AFRINIC, LACNIC for all from Mexico to Arg uh, Argentina, and ARIN operating uh, United States, Canada, and some islands in the Caribbean. This is important to know because when you find an IP address or when you're looking up an IP address, you have to know in which of the five WHOIS databases you should actually be looking. Not all information is registered in the right database. So, IANA distributes to the different uh, RARs and they distribute them down to the LIRs, the local internet registries. That can be an internet service provider, it can be an individual person, Anybody who wants to get IP addresses from the RIPE NCC can become a member and gets a block from us. And then how they distribute it further down the chain, we don't know. We have to see that registered in the RIPE database. Repeating again, IP address distribution comes from the whole block managed from the IANA to the RAR, which gets a large chunk. That uh, RAR chops it into smaller chunks. And then the LAR distributes blocks to their customers it can be a network, it can be a residential user, whoever. There are also some users that get independent blocks, so they don't go through a local internet registry. They get a block directly from the pools of the RAR through the request of an LAR. So one of our members has a customer who wants to be independent from an upstream provider. They can request then what's called a PI assignment, PI block, and that block then comes directly from our pools, but is requested through an LIR. This is all just internet bureaucracy that I'm telling you, but it's important to know so that, that you understand what you're looking at when you look at the RIPE database. So where to start looking? I have an IP address or I have a prefix. Where do I start? Uh, there are five RIRs. Each one operates independently their own database. So you could either just take the chance and look into each five RIRs, or you could cut to the chase and try to find where this IP address actually belongs to. The RIPE database is, in my opinion, because we run it, of course, I have to promote it, a great place to start. It has all the information about the IPs inside our service region, but it also has a global resource search option that tells you in which database you should actually be looking. Let's look at the first tool, the RIPE database. How many of you are familiar with the RIPE database? Half, okay, the other half. Um, the RIPE database is a public internet 
resource and routing registry database. So anybody can query it, anybody can look up information. And what's registered in that database? IP addresses, AS numbers that we distribute. Contact information, who is associated to that IP or ASN? Who is supposed to be responsible for troubleshooting purposes or answering questions from a law enforcement agency? We also have reverse DNS delegations. Uh, you know, forward DNS, you have a domain name that points to an IP address. The reverse DNS, an IP address that points to a domain name, that is also registered in the RIPE database, but only for the IP addresses that we manage. And then we also have the routing policies, which autonomous system is going to be announcing which IP addresses. This information is useful if you're trying to track an IP address and you want to know to which network it should actually be. Sometimes you can find hijacking cases where an AS number from a different region starts announcing IP addresses that don't belong to them. And checking the routing registry can give you some hints as to who the real owner or actual holder of the IP addresses is. In the RIPE database, you're going to have different types of objects that you're going to have to recognize. You have for IPs and ASNs the inetnum objects, inet6 num objects for IPv6, and autnum objects for the AS numbers. Contact information is stored in organization objects, role objects, and person objects. Role objects are groups of person objects. So if you find a role object, you might, that might lead you to more people who are related to this IP address or this network. For routing, you're going to find root objects for IPv4 and root 6 objects for IPv6. Domain objects register the reverse DNS delegations. It has nothing to do with a domain name like www.ripe.net. And for protection of objects, you have the maintainer. Because it's a public database and anybody would be able to put information or remove information, there's a security mechanism that's uh, called the maintainer object and it works like a lock on top of the other objects. Sometimes it's interesting to know who created an object, so who operates a maintainer, in order to find out if they're not related to other blocks of IP addresses. So if you find a network which is suspicious and you see a maintainer, you might want to look up that maintainer to see if they're not related to other networks which might be suspicious. Objects are just lines of text and they are split in two parts. The attributes part and the values part. The attributes part uh, has ad uh, tags or fields like in any database object and the field sort of indicates what the value means. So if I have here a person object and in the person attribute I see Pierre Malcolm, this means that this object is representing the person Pierre Malcolm. Objects have uh, attributes that are mandatory, they have to be there, and there are attributes that are optional. So you won't find all the attributes in every single object. Um, the attributes can also be mixed through each other, so you won't find objects all neat and consistent. They're going to be sometimes all mixed up. The values can be uh, text with a certain format. For example, a telephone number will always have the same format, plus um, country code, area code, and then telephone number. Email addresses will also have always the same format, but for the rest, it's all free text. There is no rule that an address has to be written in a certain way. It just has to be an address. And you can either shorten it like uh, ST for street or AV for avenue, or you can write the whole word, avenue or street. Other attributes point to certain values, which are actually the unique identifier of another object. And this is useful for relating objects to each other. Most of the objects uh, will have one or more lookup keys. These are keys which allow you to find this object when you're querying in the RIPE database. For example, the person object has the person attribute as a lookup key. I can find this object by typing Pierre Malcolm in the query. I can also find this object by typing in the email address. 
And I can find this object by typing in the nick handle. The nick handle is the unique identifier for person and role objects. Because we can have 100,000 peer Malcolms in the database and we want to individualize each person object, make them unique. So each person object will have a unique nick handle. Objects in the database are related to each other. It's not because they got married and had kids, but because they are linked to each other. There are references between the different objects. If I have an IP range which has an attribute org and a contact attribute, I can link these, this IP range to an organization and to a contact person. I can also link the contact person to the organization or the person to the organization. So if you find an object that has a link to another object, you can click on that and follow it. And then from there you can follow it to another one and then to another one and come full circle. This is important to know when you find an object in the right database, your investigation might not end just there. You might want to look at all the other objects that are linked in order to find more information. How to query the RIPE database? It's very easy. You just have to follow certain principles. Um, if you type in an IP address, what you're going to get is the smallest object in the hierarchy of address space that is registered in the RIPE database. So suppose I uh, type in uh, 193.0.20.10. That's my IP address in the office in Amsterdam. First thing the RIPE database does is goes to the largest block that includes that IP address. If there's a block underneath another object, it'll go down one level. And if there's another one underneath, it'll go down another level. And if there's another one, it'll go down another level until it reaches what's called the most specific object. The largest block are called least specific or less specific and the smallest blocks are called the most specific. If I type in text, like for example a name, I'm going to get all the objects that have that text in one of the lookup keys. For example, person objects, role objects, organization objects, and if uh, it's part of a net name of a network, I might also get an IPv4 address block. Because you can get so many objects, you're going to want to refine your queries. You don't want to get 100,000 objects and have to go through them all individually. So there are certain objects, uh, options that you can use to refine your queries. For example, do not retrieve related objects. Every time you look up an IP address, the RIPE database is going to return the IP range or the block where that IP address is included, but also all the other objects that are linked to it. Sometimes this can be a lot of objects in the results. If you exceed the total amount of objects per day, you get blocked. That's because we have to protect uh, all the users from scammers and spammers who are trying to farm email addresses or information. So in order to limit the amount of objects retrieved, turn on the do not retrieve related objects option. And uh, you can also choose, for example, the types of objects that you want in the query results. Instead of person objects or organization objects, you might want just only the IPv4 network objects, the INET nums. An interesting option, and that's why uh, previous slides I said that an interesting place to start is the RIPE database, is this, search resource objects in all available databases. The RIPE NCC runs the GRS, which is the Global Resources Service, and this is a system that queries all the other databases from the other regions and creates dummy objects in the RIPE database so that if you're querying an IP that doesn't belong to our region, it will show you the corresponding dummy object from the other region, and then you know, okay, I'm looking in the wrong place, I have to look somewhere else. I'm gonna show you how this works when I do the demos. Um, this is uh, just showing what happens if you do a query with related objects. I just put in an IP address, no options turned on. I get an object for the IPv4 network and then all the related organization person role objects in there. 
If I turn on the option, which you can also do by using the minus R flag in the query, I only get the objects that include this IP address inside the lookup keys. So in this case, I get the inetnum object with the IPv4 network and the route object with the announcing AS number. So how would this work for an LEA who's trying to find who is responsible for an IP address? Well, in the case of an one IPv4 address, when you do a query, normally you will go to the IP address, the connection. That is included inside what's called an assignment. That would be the network where that IP address is being used. And that assignment is going to belong to a larger block that's called an allocation. And the allocation has a contact information that has been verified. Every allocation that the RIPE NCC makes to a network operator or a user of IP addresses uh, is uh, registered in the RIPE database with verified contact information. This object, the assignment, is registered by the network operator and there are no strict rules as to how they have to register these networks in the RIPE database. So they can actually just put in the IP range and put in bogus information. There's nothing that stops them from doing that. So if you're looking for an IPv4 address and a user, skip this part and jump straight to this part because these people have real contact information that's been validated, verified. Same thing with IPv6. If I have one IPv6 address and I want to find who is using it, you would first look up the connection or the IPv6 address. That will probably belong to a slash 64 subnet. That slash 64 subnet will probably belong to a larger assignment. Uh, normally for homes users, you would uh, give a slash 56 IPv6 assignment or a slash 48 IPv6 assignment. From that assignment, then you probably want to go to the allocation again, which has validated, verified contact information. Besides, the holder of the allocation is the organization that first distributed that IP address or that block of IP addresses down the chain. So they should know to whom they have given it. If I have here this bottle of water, which I will in a second take a drink, and I give it to him, um, and then he just walks away. And then you want to know who has this bottle of water. Who do you ask? The person that gave the bottle of water away, me. So our recommendation is when you're looking for an IP uh, address or the user IP of an IP address, um, it's faster if you talk to the person or the organization that distributed this IP address or block of IP addresses in the first place because they know where it landed. If they made a sub-allocation, for example, a sub-block, sub-partition, and they gave it to somebody else, and this person started distributing on their own, the person who first distributed the block does not know what's happening down the chain of distribution. Let's repeat that. If you have an IP address, you will follow it to the assignment. The assignment will go to the allocation. The allocation will point to an organization object and the organization object will point to a role and probably multiple person objects. This information is verified. You can probably try contacting what's registered here, but you might be wasting valuable time. When it's, we're talking about uh, networks that, uh, or people who are doing something bad on the internet, usually they'll try to tr um, remove their tracks as fast as possible. They'll try to disappear as fast as possible. That we cannot keep in the RIPE database all the time, or we cannot verify if that information is registered correctly. But this information, we can. So if you cut to the chase, cut to this part of the investigation, you'll win time before you actually get some answer from these people.
Let's do a little series of demos. I'm going to switch to my browser. I have here a couple of IPs. There we go. How to access the RIPE database? Well, it's very easy. You have at the front page a RIPE who is text box. You can type in your query. Or you can go straight to the query page by just adding who is next to the domain. So here in this text box, you would write your search term. What are you looking for? I'm going to, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to look, sorry. I'm going to look for the IP address we're using here because I don't want to start any false investigation. Um, wait, I have IPv6. We don't have IPv6 here, do we? That must be my VPN. So. I don't have an IP or it's taking some time to load. Okay, this is what happens with live demos. Do I actually have internet? Can I have technical help? <laughs> the RIPE database is open to everybody for querying. Anybody can go to this website and start a query. Uh, but not everybody can put information in the database. Well, it seems that I'm supposed to be on the internet. One second. You know what? I'll go back to my VPN and I'll just use my examples. Yeah, I just want it on a P address. I don't want to put any, I don't want to start any false investigations. You see, when I start showing this stuff to law enforcement agencies, then they start thinking that uh, there's something suspicious going on. But it's just an example. So as long as we remember this is an example, there's nothing wrong going on with these IP addresses, I'll use my own examples, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me see if I have one, uh, if I have internet again, one second. Uh, here we go. Let's try this again. Stop. There we are. One. One, nine, three. Yeah. Yeah. 25. That's it, right? So we see this is a one IP address that's registered to this range. Let's try to make it bigger. And I can find some information already here. It says the status is assigned PA, so this is an assignment. Somebody who has a larger block gave this block to this network, the University of Lisboa. They even put a secondary description, Instituto Superior de Ciencias Sociales y Política. Sorry, I don't speak Portuguese. My apologies. It says here country PT, geolocation. So somebody has done their homework and they've registered this information very neatly. Anybody who tries to look up this IP address will find this geolocation information. And so they can uh, try to look in this place. But what you have, what you're seeing here is made by a person. It's registered by a person. It means that there's a will. Somebody wanted to register this information in this way. If this matches reality or not, you cannot know until you start investigating further. So what you're going to find in the RIPE database is somewhere to begin. Where do you go when you get an IP address? You want to find where it's being used. 
This is a great place to start. An object in the right database means that somebody took the time to register it. It was last modified in March 2017. That means that this is quite fresh information. Somebody uh, did an update in uh, March. Uh, it does say here that it was created in 1994. <laughs> and it was split. So you have here some more administrative information. Where did this IP address come from? Which of this block came from? But let's look at some other IP addresses. Uh, oh, yeah. I wanted to show you also the options. Where Sorry? Is this, information, uh, to this information is not verified. But why? why? Because uh, we don't have enough people and time to verify the thousands of objects that are created. The Redmond CC is, uh, like we said, a not for profit. We operate on the funds of the members. And every time we increase our expenses, then they look at us, you know, like, are you doing that again? So, well, it is the responsibility of the ISPs. There are rules which are called policies, which tell how to tell the ISPs how the information should be registered. Now, these rules are applied to everybody who operates something on the internet, and they're quite vague. It just says. Uh, the IP addresses should be registered and the contact information should be up to date and it should be maintained. But there are no rules that say you should register this, 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 and this. Because uh, what is really good for us in this society might not be very good for people in a different society. And the purpose of the RIPE database isn't to have a directory of who's who using which IP address, but which IP addresses are in use and how to contact somebody in order to uh, fix troubleshooting problems. Yes, at the back you had a question. Yes, we can. I'm going to show you. That sounds familiar, right? Yes, we can. Anyways, <laughs> let's, let's uh, show some more options of what the RIPE database can do. We talked about limiting the query. When I do a, a default query, I get not only the network, as you can see here, but I also get other objects related to this network. So I want to narrow down my search. I want less objects. If I check this option here, do not retrieve related objects, then notice that I only get two objects. All the other objects that were there, the organization and the person objects, are not in the results anymore. Let me show you again. I'm going to take this option off, query again. And I have the network, an organization, a role contact, and a root object. If I only wanted to have the inetnum objects, I could use this option, and here under types, I want only inetnum objects. And then I'm going to do my search again. And I've limited to only one object. This is, for me, much easier to handle than a whole bunch of objects that I have to check individually and see if it's what I'm looking for. Notice that you have here text, and you have also links. If I wanted to see who the admin C is, I can click here on this admin C, and I get a tab with the admin C object. And I can uh, click here on the text C objects, for example, this one, and I get the person that is linked to that role object. So I can actually expand my investigation by clicking, clicking through all the objects that are there. Let's close these, and let's uh, show you this other option. Search resource objects in all available databases. Uh, there was a technical problem with the... Oh. Sorry to the people who are watching the webcast. You probably uh, In the meantime, it's hot here. Yes, we know. <laughs> you don't need the right database for that. Uh, 
Again? Yeah. Okay, so you know what? That's going to take more time. Um, no, if it's, it's no? not to install, just to run because okay. I close it. But I can find it. I'll just install it. One second. What were we looking for? Ah, you are running another computer or this is local? This is the same computer, okay. only I, I can do mirror display. Okay. I'm thinking so that if we change. Do one, do one Oh. The software that I just installed, the desktop presenter. That yeah, find. desktop presenter. No, uh, no, let's desktop. just look it up. Yeah. Desktop. Desktop presenter. I'm not sure why I'm not finding it. Yeah, on I'm going to applications. Uh, yeah. Where did it install it? That's funny. Did it was it called desktop presenter? Yes. Uh, or you can just while yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just run this, uh, sure. Okay, yes. Uh, Sorry, we have to hack a little bit here. Right now it's display okay. number one. Okay. So the IP is 193. Yeah. 136.98.89. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to switch to mirror view again, so then okay. I'll, I'll swap this okay. again. Okay. Yeah. So we're back online. Three, two, one, we're back in the room. I'm going to type in a random IP address. Now, I want to know if this IP address belongs to the RIPE-NC C, to the management of ripe C, or to which other database it should belong. So I'm just going to choose here the search resource objects in all available databases. And I'm going to type in something. 191 and exactly the same thing, right? I'm going to search for that. And I get here an object allocated Tim Cellular source LACNIC. So now I know this IP address doesn't belong to the RIPE NCC, it belongs to LACNIC. I should actually be looking in that database. So I save myself a lot of time just looking, looking, looking. Maybe I've saved time checking all the other four databases before I reach this one. That is the option search resource objects in all available databases. Um, let's look up another IP address that I had here. Well, you already know what it is. <laughs> 10 dot something. For people who know about IP addresses, you know what this is, right? You know what I should be getting? Well, if I look in the GRS, it says no objects matched. But if I look in the RIPE database, it tells me this is reserved by the IETF. This is address space that is not uh, in use or distributed by the RIPE NCC. So now I'm going to go back to that IP address. Um, what was it again? 193 dot oh, can you repeat the IP address that you had? 193 dot? 136 and then So here we go. We have this assignment. We want to know who is actually responsible for this block. So what we're going to do is look for the less specific object that's <laughs> above this range. So I'm going to take the whole IPv4 range. I'm going to put it here in the query. And then there are two ways that you can apply flags to a query. You can use the hierarchy flags. In this case, I want the first level less specific. I want to go up one level less specific. Or you can write it here in the query box as a flag. I'm going to use the um, text box here. And there we go. We go up one step. We can see that this 
is uh, the IP address belongs to this range. It says allocated PA. When it says allocated PA, it means that it's a block that was given by the ripe NCC or that is managed by the ripe NCC. And this information, I don't know if you can see it, but there's like a light blue color behind some fields, some attributes. Those are values that the ripe NCC manages. That means that it's information that we have validated and that we have put in the ripe database. If I want to know who is responsible for this block, I go to the org here. I can click it. And I see that the IP address comes from an allocation or a block that's managed by the Fundasal para a Ciencia e Tecnología. And I said it wrong, right? Doesn't matter. <laughs> and these are all the contact people. I have here an email address, I have a phone number, a couple of phone numbers, a postal address. So I can actually take now physical action. I can pick up the phone, I can write an email, or I can go to this direction to talk to these people and say, hey, I have a query about this IP address. Where is it being used? So let's go back. Simple queries, it's very easy. You can use flags to make much more advanced queries or you can use the full text search which treats the ripe database as a big text uh, block of text. How are we doing with time? And I haven't re reached the best part, RipeStat. RipeStat is a tool that we've developed which takes data from different sources. Not only the RIPE database, but also sources like the routing information services and third party databases like Mac, uh, MaxMind's geolocation database. So RipeStat is what we call a one stop shop for all your information needs. You can put it there an IP address and it's going to deliver at the same time not only the database objects or where it belongs to, but also routing information. What sources does RipeStat use? Well, not only the RIPE databases, uh, but also other RIR data from APNIC, ARIN, all the other regional internet registries, BGP routing data from the routing information service, active measurements from RIPE Atlas and DNSMON, the geolocation blacklist data, and some other data sources. The query types that you can use or do in uh, RipeStat are for an IPv6 or uh, address or prefix, an IPv4 address or prefix, an AS number, you can look up a host name, and you can also look up a country code to look up a country statistics. Why would you use RipeStat? Well, uh, to answer certain questions, like for example, is someone else announcing a prefix? If you want to know if somebody is hijacking uh, an IP range, you can put it in RipeStat and see who has been announcing this IP range over time. Not only what's happening now, but what happened in the past. Is the BGP routing consistent with the routing registry? What's registered in the RIPE database? What somebody said that they were going to do? Is it what's actually happening on the internet? You can check this kind of information. You can check the reported geolocation of the prefixes. Is this IP actually located in Portugal or is it actually being used in the Netherlands? It's also very useful for viewing networks. How many IPv6 prefixes are announced in a certain uh, country? Is the IPv6 in your country compared to the neighboring countries? Well, this is more statistical information for network operators, but uh, how does an upstream outage look? Who has more peers, AS1 or AS2? When we talk about peers is which other networks are connected to a network and is exchanging information. And where can I report a abuse from? Uh, an IP address. RIS, which is one of the sources, is a really large archive of useful BGP routing information. Which AS number was announcing which prefixes, on which day, and with which options, which who are the upstreams, and what was the AS path. All this routing information can be useful if you are investigating something or an incident that happened over time and you want to see what happened, who was connected to whom, and who was exchanging data with whom. Uh, I think we have uh, historical data since 2001 when the project started, so that's quite a lot of time that we have on store. Uh, RIS collects raw data from the BGB peers, it stores it in table dumps, and we, you can actually use that data yourself. You can query the RIS database directly with your own program, or you can use it through RipeStat. 
The difference between RIS and the RIPE database is that what is registered in the RIPE database is what somebody intended to do. This is what they said that they would be doing. And what you're looking at in RIS is what's actually happen happening on the internet right now. So if you're looking up, for example, a hijack or um, if data was coming from a certain AS but it's registered differently, this is what you can actually see in uh, RIPE stat compared. Looks like this, you have a landing page with a query box. You can put in there what you're looking for, an IP address, an IP range. And once you press on search, you're gonna get the results page, which is a page with a lot of boxes. Each of these boxes is called a widget. And these widgets are individual programs that do the query to the different databases and they display it on the page. On the left side, you're gonna have the first landing page, which is called at a glance, and then different tabs which hold widgets specializing in a certain topic. For example, routing, DNS, anti-abuse, database, and so on. Uh, let's look at the different uh, characteristics of the widgets, which you can use to share information with other people and also check what source of information or data was uh, used to display this information. On this link, stat.ripe.net slash widget list, you have a complete list of all the widgets, what type of resources you can uh, put in as input, and um, yeah. I'd say if you wanna know which widgets are in there, check on the widget list. All the widgets have a little button that uh, tells you here where the source data came from. So if you click there, you'll see where this data is coming from and you can actually get the text output to use in your own programs for processing. Where's the data from? So from which source it took? Freshness and time scale of the data. How old is this data that's being displayed? In lots of widgets, you have also a time frame here which you can use to make the time wider, shorter, zoom in on a certain time. And you have the permalink button, which allows you to share this widget, uh, the results that you're seeing, you can share it with a colleague. For example, I found this information which is crucial for our investigation and I wanna share it with somebody else. I can just click here on the permalink and copy this to whomever I want so that they can see it. Let's look at RIPESTAT. I'm gonna take that same IP address, poor IP address. Uh, um. I have your RIPESTAT ready. So I'm gonna look up the IP address, I click here on search. I'm gonna get the first page at a glance, which has five widgets, the prefix overview, this first one, which says, is this address space announced? Who is announcing it? Which AS number? I can click on that to get more information. I can also see the IANA registry information for that AS number. I see here in the geolocation, let's zoom in, where it's located. This is based on MaxMind. So if it's reported wrong, we don't know how to fix it. You have to talk to MaxMind. You can see if there's any who is match. Is there an object in the RIPE database that uh, represents this IP address or includes this IP address? And you have here the routing status. When was it first seen? In, inside which prefix? Who is announcing it? And here on the left side, you have the different um, uh, topics, for example, DNS. Is there reverse DNS for this IP uh, address? There's no reverse DNS pointer, so there's nobody who created a reverse pointer, and there's no reverse DNS host name. In the anti-abuse, you can see if this has ever been on a blacklist, whoops. So sometime in the past, I think this IP address was used for something naughty. <laughs> 2010. I guess you solved the problem because it's all clean. 
Uh, in the geographic, you can see the geolocation. Again, it's the, what's reported. Let's see if it's accurate. Well, somehow we're not here. <laughs> But well, that's that's the problem with geolocation. Database, geolocation databases take information from different sources and they compile it into a sort of average. So if you're using this this widget to find somebody, be careful because you know that story about the IP address in America that's actually located on a farm, and every time they got an abuse complaint, they went to that farm and the poor people had to move. Okay, you want to avoid that, of course. Uh, activity, you can see uh, the observed bandwidth. Well, this takes a while because it takes the information from RIPE Atlas. Network activity, how many probes are inside this network. And I get the beach ball of death. Oh, there we go. Somebody is running a RIPE Atlas uh, measurement. RIPE Atlas is another tool that we run, which uh, does pings and trace routes to several probes distributed around the world. Uh, there was no activity observed there. So you can see a lot of information all at one glance, which could give you a lead as to where you should proceed further. Should I uh, talk to the LAR? Am I actually looking uh, at the wrong, uh, sorry, at the right country? There are cases um, reported by Europol I can talk about this because they presented already, so it's not secret information. But they were following um, a server which was reported to be, to be in Germany. But when they started looking at the objects and the information in Ripestat, they found out that what was reported to be in Germany was actually not there, it was in Romania. And the way that they've found this is by looking at all this information and looking at the different aspects of the routing, the registration, is what's registered, what's actually happening. The objects that we see in the RIPE database are all pointing to the same IP address or networks. So using all this information, they could actually trace um, to the company where they should have sent the MLAT or the request for information. Oops, go back. So, RIPE stat, Questions? <laughs> yes? You talked about the BGP footing um, when they announce practices that they don't own. It seems, uh, I'm, I'm going to become a student of telecom engineer, and it seems to me that sometimes security is seen as something you put on top of it. But actually, in the, the network infrastructure, there's no guarantee that the fact that you arrive wherever you send it. And it happens, and it has happened, that Google has been announced by companies in Ireland, and Trump is going to Yeah, yeah. Well, you all, uh, I don't know if you all know, but there's a very famous hijack case, the YouTube Pakistan telecom case, where Pakistan wanted to announce a more specific uh, part of the YouTube address space, and then the upstream provider didn't filter correctly, so all the traffic started going to Pakistan instead of to YouTube servers. But that is not something that uh, we could have prevented. The upstream provider should have filtered correctly. And somebody should fix BGP once and for all, right? <laughs> um, but no, do you have any questions about the services and tools, how to use them? Uh, the main message that we wanted to convey today is that there's a lot of information. We have a lot of information, but it's only a starting point. You will not find in the RIPE database who is using an IP address. It can be a dog, a cat, a mule, anybody could be behind a computer. What you're looking for is the network where this computer, this piece of hardware is connected and has this IP address configured. And that's a great place to start. Yeah? To download the RIPE database? Yeah. Yeah, yes, you can download a mirror of the database, but the contact information the pri for privacy reasons is dumbified. So you, will not, you won't find email addresses and stuff like that. 
but you will find all the island num objects pointing to person objects and organization objects. So you can do mass queries on your own mirrored version of the database and then once you've found what you want you can check the real database to get the real contact information. So yes, it's possible. Yes? Yes. Yes. Uh, I can't demonstrate. I'm not a developer, but I can show you where it is. If you go to the ripe.net website slash developer, you're going to get there all the developer documentation, all the APIs for the ripe database, for the LIR portal, for ripe atlas for RipeSat, so you can actually create your own application that interfaces with these services and displays, of course, the information that you want. Yes? About geolocation, uh, you mentioned uh, if there is a problem, talk to MassMind, but uh, RipeMCC is the customer of MassMind. Yes. So if RipeMCC members complain about bad data from MassMind, that's why we have the little disclaimer. <laughs> and well, the thing is, if MaxMind starts, starts showing wrong information all the time, then we can choose to have a different provider. But the data that MaxMind puts in their database is their responsibility. We, we cannot be chasing after every uh, inconsistent input that they have. Yeah. And they seem to ignore all the, all the requests. All the requests to fix that. Yeah, well, um, the RIPE NCC has a coordination function for the internet. So you can try to resort to us to talk to them because we have uh, other contact information than what's publicly available. So uh, if you can build a case and say, look, I've sent 100 emails and I've called 20 times and nobody at MaxMind replies, you can always ask the RIPE NCC, could you guys talk to MaskMind? And of course, that's what we're here for, to talk as last resort. <laughs> Any other questions? Just a comment. Yes. Uh, I saw you using MaskMind to Geolite, which is actually a free deprecated uh, database. Oops. <laughs> so I can use it. Uh, and it's, it's, not, it's no longer developed, I think. Yeah. Um, I guess that we don't have budget to pay MaxMind for their full services. I'm not completely aware of, of uh, what the deal is. Okay. But, yeah. If it's Geolite, I'm pretty sure it's the, the free one that's also on PHP. And Might be the cheap subscription. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not for profit, we have to take, take care of what we do. Any, yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? Um, well, yes. Uh, the thing is that you would download the compressed mirror set, uh, the, what's called the delegated files, and uh, you can sort out from the, the data set the blocks that have uh, country code uh, Portugal. The thing is that um, you could either uh, download all the data for the organizations that are registered in Portugal, or all the data for the networks that are registered in Portugal. So there's a lot of different variations where the word Portugal comes in mind. Yeah? Do you have any examples uh, of uh, ISPs or network operators uh, working with you guys to get information from the, the real database to, to get all the EGB history? I'm concerned myself about the uh, the routing quality of the that they have. Yeah, um, yes, I could look up examples. I, don't, I didn't prepare any, but there's uh, several ISPs that have links to RipeStat widgets on their front page. Um, if you give me a couple of minutes, I can look that up for you. Yes, of course, yeah, no problem. Yes? Sorry, you mentioned uh, the Pakistani RPKI, sure. Um, if you know about the YouTube uh, problem, uh, BGP is not safe. 
it's a, it's a quite open protocol. Anybody can just start announcing anybody's uh, prefixes. And if there's no good filtering set up, uh, things can happen on the internet, which were not the intention. So they created what's called the Internet Routing Registry, where they register objects uh, where they say, this prefix range is going to be announced by this AS number. That's what you should expect. Build your filters based on these registrations. Now, the thing is that there's about 30-something uh, routing registries across the world, and they're not mirrored. What's registered in ARIN is not mirrored in the RIPE database, and it's not mirrored in the RADB database. So it's not 100% reliable. So at some point, uh, somebody said, what about if we inserted certificates in this whole process? We create a digital certificate that certifies that this AS number is going to be announcing these IP addresses, and we put all these certificates in a central repository, and anybody who wants to use these certificates can download them, validate them, and then create their filtering based on these uh, uh, digital certificates. So um, some years ago, the engineers got together and they developed RPKI, which is, um, let me see if I can get to the page, RPKI validator, uh, damn it. If I would have known, I would have prepared something. <laughs> Yeah, well, but it's another tool. It is another tool. Do we have time? I'm going to the RPKI validator uh, page, and we should have actually a, yeah. So you would have two parts in this RPKI uh, certification. You have the validating part, the person, the, the people or the organization that issues the digital certificate. They create these certificates and say, these IP addresses, which are mine, which I hold, will be announced by this AS number, which can be his or not. That's up to them. That is stored in the um, um, central repository, like one of, of which the RIPE NCC operates. And then you, as a network operator, you want to see if this person has made the statement, has created the certificate. And you download then the RPKI validator, which can be run on any small Linux box, or uh, you should check if your router has this RPKI uh, support already built in. You would download all these certificates, do the whole validation process, and then create your um, uh, workflow or filters based on these digital certificates. I'm going to see if I can find the validator online. It's too hot to think. Uh, rpki.write.net. Or was it slash certification? Okay, while well, this goes nowhere, I'm going to slash certification. <clears throat> Here we go, the test environment. Ba, 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 ba. Please wait, it's loading everything. Logging in. Okay, here we have the dashboard. I can see that um, we have three certified resources. Uh, one of them is my AS number, or our AS number, a slash 21 prefix, and a slash 48 IPv6 prefix. So these for these three resources, we have uh, certificates created. Um, we have three ROAS. ROAS are uh, root, root origin uh, attestations or authorizations. And there's a certificate that says this IP address will be announced by this AS number. We can see them here. So this would be on the... Um, um, what's it called again? Not the validating side, but the other side, the cert certifying side. I'm certifying that these IP addresses, the slash 23 and the slash 21 and the slash 48, are going to be announced by this AS number. You can see here that um, it's the, there's certain variations, like most specific length allowed. 
48, meaning that you should expect only a slash 48 from this announcement, nothing smaller. Here it says 21, you should only expect the slash 21 being announced. And here it says 24. From the slash 23, you can do actually three different types of announcements. One is for the whole slash 23, one is for one half of the slash 23, and the other one is for the other half of the slash 23. So there's different variations in what you could actually do in BGP. Here in history, you can see the difference. Well, there's no history actually. And where there are no announcements. Oh yeah, because this is the right meeting. Uh, I'm sorry I can't dis display the validator because I don't remember the link. But anyways, does that kind of answer quickly your question? My point is that if someone with AS number 10,000 will try to uh, uh, announce the route, uh, they will not have a certificate. Uh, yeah. So the thing is with, with our PKI is like he's saying, if somebody else would try to announce one of our IP ranges, it would not match, this would not match in BGP with what's certified. So if you're validating against the certificates, you can see this in the validator and say, this is suspicious behavior. Should I accept this announcement or should I filter it? Based on, uh, if, if you trust the person who created the certificate, you can decide to take those routing decisions. Look on the certification page. I'm sorry, I don't have as so much time and I'm melting. Any other questions? No? Good. Thank you.